Now I'm going to hand over, it's a great pleasure to hand over to Arabella Thais, who's speaking to us from Paris and from a very elegant looking flat in Paris. <laughs> uh, and uh, she is a writer, speaker, philosopher, and artist currently, um, or maybe just completed um, a PhD in cosmology and consciousness at the California Institute for Integral Studies. And her work in Towards the Evolution of Humanity explores the intersection of poetry, mathematics, beauty, and time. And she teaches this in her online school of, of consciousness, the temple, using various mediums, music, film, and experience design in order to communicate ideas and propel human transformation. And it's very exciting to have you here, Arabella, um, as someone about half the age of all the rest of the presenters. And so we must really create a movement um, for young people, which we are in, indeed doing within the network with new paradigm navigators as of which you are part so over to you thank you david that was a really wonderful introduction and thank you for your opening slides um i'm extremely excited to be here today and i firstly wanted to express my gratitude to you to, to david lorimer and to Irvin laszlo for allowing me to be a contributor um, to this incredible project it is such an honor and a privilege and I'm really excited to uh, present my great, great passion with you today, which is about the nature and meaning of beauty. So I refined the title a little bit <clears throat> because this just feels a bit more um, accurate for what I really want to share today. How beauty can change the world, architecting utopia on Earth. And before I begin, I'd like to preface this presentation by saying that you don't need to understand everything that I'm going to say because I'm about to deliver a lot of information. You don't need to assimilate everything. And I encourage you and I invite you just to turn down the volume of your left brain, of the rational analytic part of your consciousness, and simply receive the frequency of the transmission. What is beauty? Beauty, like time, is not easy to define. Any attempts to describe it will always fall short of the experience of beauty itself. Its ineffability is indicative of its fundamental nature, that it points towards something beyond, something beyond the words, beyond the music, beyond the stars, and yet within them. Beauty then, while in the world, is not of the world. Rather, it is cosmic, both imminent and transcendent, subjective and objective, the beginning and the end of it all. Yes, I believe that beauty is the alpha and the omega, our original point of departure and that to which we shall return. In other words, I believe that beauty, true beauty is God. Accordingly, I propose that it is beauty first and foremost that will evolve the world. This chimes with the words of the great Italian poet Dante, who said that, quote, the world will be saved by beauty, as well as John Keats oft quoted line, truth, beauty, beauty, truth, that is all you know on earth and all you need to know. To understand beauty then is to understand that it is the truth with a capital T. Commune with beauty and you commune with truth, i.e. cosmic consciousness. To commune with truth is to communicate with it. To communicate with truth is to touch it, taste it, hear it, make love with it. This is the essence of divine and holy communion. This is why I suggest that beauty has the power to redeem us all, because the aesthetic experience confers the potential to commune with God. The deeper one plums into beauty, experientially and intellectually, into its meaning and relationship with this universe, the less one is able to sustain the sort of reductionist, materialist worldview upon which mainstream science is still founded. Because... Beauty unveils a cosmos that is incontrovertibly conscious and self-realizing, infused with miracles and magic at every level. The truth is that ours is an ensouled universe, a universe with a purpose, and the purpose is this, to realize a state of what Irvin Laszlo calls supercoherence, i.e. absolute unity, which is perfection, completion, and absolute beauty. So 
in order to upshift human consciousness, we need a governing tenet, a North Star whose light shines upon all of us, guiding us towards the same destination. I nominate beauty to be this for us, to be the fundamental principle within which we can couch new paradigm cosmology and within which we can place the new human story, as in the epic tale of our unfolding evolution. Similarly, beauty offers the principle through which we can architect political philosophies, design new systems, and build regenerative communities of light, freedom, and creativity. The metaphor of beauty as our North Star is a pertinent one, because as we know, the North Star is associated with the magnetic North Pole, and the star itself is called Polaris. Magnetic force fields are attractors, and beauty seen thus is like a cosmic magnet pulling us towards it. This resonates with Socrates' idea that poetic brilliance has a divine source, that poetic inspiration is received by the poet from the muses, and they from the cosmic forms, like a series of interlocking magnets. I wholeheartedly agree with the conception of beauty as put forth by Socrates and Plato in the Platonic Dialogues. As I am sure many of you know, Plato was the first Western philosopher to properly expound and explore the nature of beauty. And I believe that his ideas on the matter are unsurpassed. Plato associated beauty with the highest truth and the highest good, and thus the highest iteration of justice, virtue, and so on. Beauty is the original archi, the first principle of the world. Hence, quote, the contemplation of beauty causes the soul to grow wings. Why? Because beauty literally elevates our soul. I also believe that it is in a toroidal spiraling motion akin to the Fibonacci sequence that beauty pulls us towards higher consciousness, that it beckons us closer to goodness, purity and joy, to wonder and perfection, in other words, towards absolute bliss, which is the quintessence of utopia. I also agree with Plotinus that, quote, the soul that beholds beauty becomes beautiful. Beauty ought to be our governing principle as we build the new earth because it is self-generative, i.e. beauty breeds beauty. The more exposed you are to beauty, the more attuned you become to it, the more the beauty that intrinsically resides within you can come forth. Beauty is therefore autopoetic. It births and becomes itself. This, by the way, makes total sense if we accept that the apex of cosmic consciousness is beauty, and our minds are but fractal shards of the one cosmic mind. Beauty, then, is who and what we really are, and thus, in this very moment now, in contemplating beauty, we are becoming it. According to Plato, when we come into this world, we drink from the river of forgetfulness and we now occupy a state of collective amnesia. It is beauty that can help us to remember. The next question to ask ourselves then is what constitutes beauty? How and where does it show up in our existence? Now, I could deconstruct this for hours, but I have limited time, so I'll try and be as brief as possible. I think the main thing here is the question of whether beauty is unequivocal. There is a famous phrase that says, beauty is in the eye of the beholder, but I wonder, is this always true? Is beauty entirely subjective, something that we project onto the world, or is it an intrinsic property of the universe that iterates itself across a spectrum? Obviously, I am gunning for the latter. Consider how there are pinnacle expressions of beauty wherein its presence is undeniable, such as the starry night sky, a rose in bloom, or superlative art, a Rembrandt painting, Shakespeare's Hamlet, or a Beethoven quartet, for example. No one can dispute that these are beautiful. To apprehend a vast mountain range or a murmuration of starlings and fail to perceive the beauty in it does not mean that beauty is a construct, rather that that person in question is so violently desensitized that they cannot see it. Indeed, the more sensitive a person is, the more attuned they are to beauty, the more profound is their response to it. Thus, artistic geniuses, as well as aesthetically inflected mathematicians and philosophers, are closer to cosmic truth. Some examples would be Virginia Woolf, the Romantic Poets, 
Johann Kepler, Leonard Euler, and Pythagoras, to name but a few. Our starting place then is to seek entities that bestow a consensual aesthetic response. Then we can examine why this is. For example, why is Euler's equation considered to be the most beautiful? Well, one of the core themes belying beauty is deep underlying unity. The harmonic structure of beauty is such that each constituent part serves to enhance all the others and belongs to a cohesive whole greater than the sum of its parts. Now this not need be overtly apparent. Indeed, often the most beautiful things have harmony so deeply embedded, it is not, it is not, <clears throat> excuse me, immediately perceptible. In the words of T.S. Eliot, quote, genuine poetry communicates before it is understood. A mark of true beauty then is its capacity to confer meaning far beyond the scope of language. Resonance. Beauty is a coherent resonance with an intrinsically fractal nature. Remember, everything is a frequency and waveforms are either coherent or not. This building here in the right-hand corner is, I think, quite clearly not beautiful. While the building on the left, the Parthenon in the Acropolis in Athens, is absolutely beautiful. Why is this? Well, a number of reasons. For example, the temple is built out of natural materials. In this case, a pale golden stone that emulates the radiant warmth of the sun. It was built with the intention of creating beauty and sacramental devotion to the goddess Athena. And the architectural design is based on the golden mean, phi, an irrational number, i.e. an infinite number. The geometric structure of the building, therefore, is a literal physical expression of infinity with infinitude. Since the golden mean is found throughout nature, such as the logarithmic spiral of a seashell of our Milky Way galaxy, the Parthenon seamlessly blends in with the surrounding landscape. But not only does it blend in, I suggest it actively enhances the landscape. Like a resonant frequency, it amplifies the waveform of beauty and truth. The building on the right is basically the inverse of everything I just said. It is the polar opposite to beauty. It does not elevate, it depresses. In the words of the German romantic Wolfgang von Goethe, quote, architecture is frozen music. If the resonance of each building were perceptible to the human ear, I wonder what each would sound like. Perhaps, though, if we attuned ourselves correctly, if we live from our imagination, our heart and our felt intuition, we could learn how to hear the underlying cosmic music. Beauty then is a pathway into new epistemologies, into upshifted pathways of knowing. <clears throat> the term aesthetics comes from the word aesthesis, meaning to sense, to feel. Beauty is a felt experience and our immediate perception of it is somatic and intuitive. It can never be divorced from feeling, even if the aesthetic experience is connected with reason and logic. We know when we are in the presence of beauty because it absorbs us and transforms us. It calls out to us and beckons us forward. It sings the song of remembrance. Our intellect and reason can then crystallize the experience of beauty, but this comes afterwards and completes the experience much like the heros gamos, the sacred marriage of the masculine and feminine, a divine union equivalent with the union of intellect and intuition, mind and body, reason and imagination, heaven and earth. This divine union is erotic and ecstatic, but for it to be realized, the primacy of feeling and intuition must be honored. The Greek word ecstasis, literally meaning outside of oneself. To touch beauty is to die for a moment, transcend the ego and become immortal. To touch beauty is to remember the perfection of source consciousness, and it is orgasmic, as Santa Teresa seen here in Bernini's sculpture of her makes abundantly clear. I believe that utopia belongs to these mystical waters that is literally a new vibrational structure of consciousness that I term the ero aesthetic dimension. It is supposed to feel psychedelic, euphoric, and of course, inexpressibly beautiful. 
This accords with philosopher and mathematician Alfred North Whitehead's idea of divine erotic lures that pull evolution forwards towards ever greater beauty. Whitehead understood that for us to evolve, we had to move beyond the simple Christian notion of God as agape love and include erotic love as well. Similarly, Socrates spoke about erotic love as, quote, a kind of madness, that which someone shows when he sees the beauty we have down here and is reminded of true beauty. The journey of our remembering is the greatest love story of all time. And as we spiral towards final completion, what the theologian and geologist Pierre Teilhard de Chardin called the Omega Point, depicted here on the left bottom hand corner, we are building momentum. Trigger alert. Could it be that the Omega Point is in fact a gargantuan cosmic orgasm, the climax to end all others, the frequency of true bliss, beauty, and completion? I certainly think so. Excuse me. It is this frequency that has been prophesized and make no mistake, we live in times of prophecy. This is the dawning of the sixth sun that the Mayans predicted in the end of the Kali Yuga. We have also just entered the age of Aquarius. Society and patriarchal monotheistic religions have elided this fact that our greatest poets have always, that our greatest prophets, excuse me, have always been poets. For prophecy is a kind of poetry. According to art critic and polymath John Ruskin, quote, to see clearly as poetry, prophecy, and religion all in one. Similarly, the oracles at Delphi would utter prophecies in a state of divine erotic madness, allied with the same madness of poetic inspiration. Various romantic poets, such as Coleridge, Keats, and Novalis, also spoke about a return to Utopia, to Arcadia, the land of milk and honey. Clairvoyance, then, is deeply aesthetically inflected. Hence, our greatest visionaries have been super connected to beauty. I believe what is required to upshift human consciousness is an aesthetic, artistic, countercultural revolution that will make the 1960s look like a mere dress rehearsal. We require a revolution that deploys beauty as a means to communicate truth. The time has come then for Romanticism 2.0, Romanticism at a higher octave. In the words of William Blake, the ancient tradition that the world will be consumed in fire at the end of 6,000 years is true, as I have heard from hell. For the cherub with his flaming sword is hereby commanded to leave his guard at the tree of life. And when he does, the whole creation will be consumed and appear infinite and holy, whereas now it appears finite and corrupt. This will come to pass by an improvement of sensual enjoyment. Finally, revelation is coming true. The upshift of human consciousness is birthing the new heaven and the new earth. In order for us to realize this new vibration, the energy of the goddess and the erotic feminine must be at the forefront, I believe. This is a Venusian energy, the energy of beauty, desire, creative power, emotion, feeling, intuition, and imagination. It is collaborative, non-hierarchical, abundant, and del delicious. If we align with the frequency of the Eero aesthetic, then we shall align with the frequency of the Omega point, the erotic attractor of true beauty, the teleological magnet that is pulling us towards the end of time. A bunch of patriarchal sociopathic despots is not the vibe. A naked woman on a flying cat, however, as you can see up here, is very much the vibe. So I ask you, which would you rather which would you rather? And I believe we need to stop fearing uh, feminine erotic power as it has been suppressed and feared for millennia. Finally then, in the words of Michelangelo, I saw the angel in the marble and I carved until I set him free. The truth is utopia already exists. It is already realized because all time is simultaneous and the future is here now. The future, like beauty, is a frequency. Our task then is the artist's task. We must keep chipping away at illusions, distortions and discordance until utopia, i.e. true beauty, is unveiled. 
I believe that utopia is equivalent to what Richard Wagner called the Gesamtkunstwerk, or total artwork, an artwork that synthesizes all artistic mediums, music, poetry, chromatics, sculpture, and so on. As Pythagoras so famously said, quote, there is geometry in the humming of the strings. There is music in the spacing of the spheres. This universe <laughs> is a resonant cosmic symphony and our life is a work of art. If we move towards beauty, to the pathway of divine love, both erotic and agapeic, then we can realize utopia on earth. The time has come to remember we belong to beauty and we are destined to architect the ultimate aesthetic masterpiece. Beauty is the truth, the rhyme and the reason, the beginning and the end of it all. Thank you for listening. Wow, <clears throat> very powerful. Uh, thank you so much, Arabella. Thank uh, you. And, and uh, you know, just a, a very distinctive voice you have, voice in the sort of general sense, you know, not just your voice, but your what you're saying um, and and what 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 you you represent, what you convey, and just just one reference point which occurred to me, and that's a, there's a huge four volume work that I reviewed by Christopher Alexander. Not sure whether you you're aware of his work. Um, it's called The Nature of Order. Mm. And one of the things he discovered in relation to beauty um, was was that we do have an intrinsic sense of proportion. Mm. Um, and because we are cert proportioned in certain ways ourselves, when we see something which is the golden mean, the golden section, sacred geometry, then we immediately resonate with it. Um, whereas um, the opposite is also true. Uh, and he, one of the arresting stories about him was that he he had to give the prizes at an architecture school and um, and he looked at all the work that people had done and he asked the students does anyone do any of you actually like any of your work and i thought this was a very telling remark um but because they they, they had done something clever but probably not beautiful mm, mm. i think the more beautiful something is the more truthful it is Indeed, indeed. Goodness, truth and beauty. So I think, thank you very much indeed.